Okay, we covered um, uh, isoparametric formulation, uh, quadratic elements, higher order interpolation, and today I will cover a new topic, um, beams, uh, and I'll move with that. Finite, finite elements for beams. Uh, so typically beams will be slender structures uh, that can be used to model 3D solids. But these 3D solids are slender. Typically, it, they can be non-uniform cross-section, but the cross-section has to be small compared to the length of the beam, of the part. Uh, and in this example, I have a bridge, and then I have a tower. But uh, these are civil engineering structures, but you can also find them in aircraft and many other um, components of, uh, that we see daily in real life. Um, so the first one that we'll be discussing today is 1D Euler Bernoulli beam, which I covered a little bit about the fundamentals maybe uh, the second week of class. Uh, I'll revi rev revisit this a little bit with you. 1750s, Euler Bernoulli, you know, looked at this um, uh, modeling approach, a simplified approach to the problem by uh, representing um, a, a beam, in essence, that represents the behavior of the 3D solid. Um, and it only depends on the X coordinate. You can see here, it only depends on the X coordinate along the length of the beam. Um, this is an uh, assumption that Ole Bernoulli made, this particular assumption where the normal remains normal after deformation. Um, so basically the cross-section remains normal to the neutral axis after deformation. Uh, that assumption is really true for very long beams. So if you have very long beams uh, in the order of t over l length of 1 over 15 or so, that's a good assumption. Okay. Uh, and then we looked at uh, the distributed loads are get reacted by uh, a moment and a shear uh, also. Okay, and then we went through the derivations, uh, force equilibrium. Uh, we took a little box of element. Uh, we, we said, okay, there's a moment here, a uh, shear here. Um, and with that information, we developed the force equilibrium and the moment equilibrium. And we came up with two equations here shown here, which we went through already, and it's also covered in your mechanics of material cores. Um, and we came up with this uh, relationship for um, moment and the distributive force, okay? So this is just more of a overview of what we covered already and also covered extensively in your mechanics of material cores. Uh, we talked also that this cross-section remains normal to the neutral axis that's a fundamental assumption. And what does that mean if the cross-section remains perpendicular to the neutral axis? What is, what is really happening? What is, what is the implications of that on the, on the, on the strains? If there's no change in angle, it means that the transverse shear is zero. Is that true? The shear that describes this little cube here does not get distorted. You have no distortion of that cube due to deformation. Is that true? Yeah. yeah so, so this assumption that, that he made actually works out. This, this assumption he made um, proves, in fact, that his, his assumption works out. If you were to calculate shear deformation due to this uh, uh, deflection assumption, you will find that it does work out. You will get basically zero uh, shear, transfer shear. Uh, so we cover that. Uh, we talked about um, um, what this moment represents in, in order Bernoulli beam theory, and, and we found that moment is related to the stress in this manner. Uh, we also plugged in what stress is in terms of modulus and strain, and we found that I have this relationship. And since I know the strain, which is really the curvature, remember, the curvature of the beam, we talked about that, uh, then when I plug that in here, now I have y times y integral over dA, and that gives me the inertia. So I have EI W double prime. So now I know my moment in terms of the uh, deflection, transverse deflection. So moment is related to the curvature of that beam. Okay, so we covered this also. And then we plugged in this relationship that we just derived into the Gorman equation, and then we found the equilibrium equation for Euler-Bernoulli beam. Okay. I also did this 
using the total potential energy and then we worked the steps and I showed you how uh, basically by minimizing the total potential energy I get the weak form which is the weak form that you get by um, forming the weighted residual for this and I'll show you what we've done before so we took um, the differential equation and then we multiplied it by a weight function v right so this was your residual function we integrated this over the domain we made the error orthogonal to each of the weight functions and the next step is that we lowered the continuity requirements because if I wanted to use strong form Galerkin, then I need a higher order of continuity requirements remember and I also have to satisfy all boundary conditions so the idea was to take this fourth order differentiation and bring it basically to half to two and share the derivative with this weight function that way I have lowered the continuity requirements and now I have only have to satisfy the essential boundary conditions and so with that we integrated by parts uh, this term times that and then we integrated by parts until they had shared it equally double derivatives here and double here okay and then uh, we derive the weak form and the weak form is given here at the bottom and you realize very quickly that I have a V times this term here and then V prime times this term here and by looking at this we also notice that um, this will tell us what kinds of essential boundary conditions we would have in the problem because V and I told you this already that we're going to focus your attention to the V's to figure out what would be the essential boundary conditions and so here um, uh, we quickly realize that we have a V and a V prime so I'll switch V prime to W to figure out what is my essential boundary condition of the problem so anytime I have W specified or W prime specified that tells me that those are essential boundary conditions um, and I, I know that now and so anything else will be a natural boundary condition uh, we also notice very quickly that this was a shear this term is shear and this is moment okay that's the moment um, and so so with that we developed the weak form uh, by the way this is the weak form um, so there's nothing more to do but we did more uh, um, more manipulation just to keep things simple we also so then I expanded this so I made this V uh, just call it V and that's what you want to do in your homework and, and, and the different problems you will call this something you can call it a variable because this quantity wh when it's given if the natural boundary condition was given you will substitute the natural boundary con condition directly in here okay directly in there uh, so that's why we call it M and V uh, because maybe they are specified maybe um, and so expanded form, this is the way it looked. Uh, if I want to just expand out the boundary conditions, this is the way it looked. Um, we, we wanted to do a little trick here, so I have a plus sign, plus sign here. I want to make this minus, so that when I bring all these terms to the other side later on, they're all positive. And to do that, we realize that we have to turn this moment the other way, uh, but everything else stays the same. And then here, the shear has to be turned the other way and then everything else that stays the same. So it's a little trick, but not, nothing to be worried about. Um, it's more for convention purposes. Uh, and then when you do that, you plug this back in here, what you get is your weak form Galerkin, uh, with now you have the Vs here, uh, and everything is minus sign with the Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And so this is the weak form. Um, it's just a different way of looking at it, but it's still the weak form. Um, and, and if if I plug in what Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 are, these are what we had defined. So it's, it's nothing different. I just put the, a variable there and, and name there. Okay. Um, so that's that's a weak form. And now if I want to develop element formulation, right? That's what we're trying to do. Um, we can do that. Um, so the first step. I don't know why this is not showing up. Um, okay, we'll continue here. So, 
we talked about uh, developing a weak form galeric,ing right? And how do I know which variables here, what are the variables that should be continuous across element boundaries? Because when I develop an element, I want to know what should be continuous from one element to another element. How do I find this out? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, but which, how do I know which nodal unknowns should be continuous across element boundaries? Essential. The essential boundary conditions will give me a clue of what are the variables that should be <coughs> continuous across element boundaries. So in this theory, a beam cannot have a kink. It needs to be continuous across element boundaries. We know that. Because when I look at the essential boundary conditions, these guys here, right here, are telling me what should be continuous across. So when I look at V and V prime, if I switch that to W, it's just telling me that W and W prime need to be continuous across element boundaries. Is that clear? Yes? Like when we had the heat transfer problem, right? The essential boundary condition was anything specified on temperature. Well. That tells me what needs to be continuous across element boundaries. The temperature needs to be continuous across element boundaries. For um, the bar problem, we also found that for the bar problem, the displacement was the one that had the essential boundary condition specified to. That means that displacement has to be continuous across element boundaries. Is that clear how you figure that out? OK, because, go ahead, please. Remember that uh, the question for the video is why the forces cannot be continuous. That's enforced through the natural boundary conditions. For the essential, what, what we're trying to do is to plug in an approximation function, right, that has unknown coefficients. And these unknown coefficients uh, are the ones now we've redefined it from which we're in two finite elements to be the unknown quantities of the nodes, right? So those unknown quantities have been related now to displacements. And in this case, we need to relate it to slope. Those are the two quantities that need to be across, continuous across element boundaries. But also, the approximation function only needs to satisfy the essential boundary conditions, right? Those are the only ones that need to be satisfied, the essential boundary conditions. And for that reason, the force may not be continuous across, necessarily. OK? All right. So. This is uh, um, the weak form galerkin. We developed that. Now, if I choose an approximation function now, that approximation function, how many unknowns will it have then at each node? One? Two. Two. How many vote for one? Raise your hand if you vote for one. How many vote for two? Two unknowns at each node. Why do you say that we need two? Because I have two essentials at each side. I have V L and V prime L in one side, and then V zero and V prime at the other side. So I have four. I have four unknowns now, right? Two nodal quantities that are unknown at one node. Two nodal quantities that are unknown at the other node. They have physical meaning. Okay. So if I were to ask you, what polynomial do I need? If I have four unknown coefficients, what order polynomial do I need? Cubic polynomial will have four unknown coefficients, right? So if I have a cubic polynomial, I can then use that. I'll just use a cubic polynomial from my approximation function, OK? And my, my nodal quantities will look like this, theta 1, v1, and then theta 2, and v2. I'll call them that. Okay, this is my nodal quantities. Where W sub zero at zero is V one, W prime at zero is theta one, W at L is V two, W prime at L is theta two. Now I can have done this in a natural coordinate system where every goes, everything goes from minus one to one, but since I'm teaching a new concept, I don't want to compound what I've taught you last week with this topic. Otherwise, it would be too much. But you can also do this using uh, a, a, a coordinates that go from minus 1 to 1, OK? I just want to not compound things too much, OK? So 
Here, this is my approximation function, right? In weak form Galerkin, what you will have done in weak form Galerkin? In a normal weak form Galerkin? I'll have figured out whether this, we, I'll have figured out whether this polynomial that I chose satisfies the essential boundary conditions. That's what I'll have done, okay? We know right now this polynomial does not satisfy the essential boundary conditions. If I assume that this for, for this element, these are my essential boundary conditions, right? If I assume these are my essential boundary conditions, this polynomial doesn't really satisfy that. Because if I plug in x equals 0, do I get v1 automatically? No, I get c sub 0. So it's not, it's not really quite right. So to do that, uh, I will try to satisfy. So I'll impose the boundary conditions here, and I did it one by one, OK? And so how many, how many coefficients I have? C1, C sub 0, C sub 2, C sub 3, right? I have to solve for C1, C2, C3, C4, and plug it back in to my polynomial. So everything is now in terms of V1, V2, theta 1, and theta 2. Is that clear what I'm trying to do here? Everybody in the back, if you follow, OK? OK, excellent. So, so if I do that, do you agree that my approximation function now is in terms of all these unknown coefficients? This, this is what I'll get, OK? Uh, I did that in Mathematica, OK? I did it in Mathematica. And, uh, uh, but the math looks like this. This is my four equations. You know, so I can invert this to get C sub 0, 1, 2, and 3. I can invert it. Then when I get this C sub 0, C1, C2, and C3 in terms of V1, theta 1, V2, theta 2, I plug that in here. Uh, and now my approximation function will only be a function of this V1, theta 1, V2, and theta 2. Okay? Now, but what I really want to have, what I really want to have is an approximation function that has an unknown coefficient times a shape function, plus an unknown coefficient times another basis function, plus another unknown coefficient times another basis function, right? Like you've done in weak form Galerkin. I will not be able to accomplish that in this form, so I need to figure out what is the coefficient to, I really want to know an expression that looks like this. I want something that says v1 times n1 plus theta1 times n2 plus v2 times n3 plus theta 2 times n4. In weak form Galerkin, this used to be your fees. Remember, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4. So we're not doing anything too different. I just call it n now, because now the way we're writing it is a little bit different. These n's have shape. They have properties also. And also, these unknown coefficients now have physical meaning. They, they mean something. While in weak form Galerkin, they didn't mean anything. You know, these, these coefficients here have no meaning. Okay. And also, it was difficult for us to make sure that um, one element to another element, I have continuity requirements met. Okay? So uh, to do that, to find these unknown coefficients, do you agree that if I wrote W tilde as a function of x, do you agree that this will have been in terms of all these quantities now? Yeah? It, it will not have the C0, C1, C2, C3, right? It will not have any of that. It will be all in terms of v1, theta1, v2, theta2. Uh, so for me to find the coefficient to v1, what you can do is take the derivative w that came from here with respect to v1, and you will get n1. Okay? So in Mathematica, you will do that, and you will get n1. And then you will get n2, n3, and n4. And I invite you to do it at home so you can see that it works out. Uh, there's other ways to do it. There's other ways you can do this, and I taught you other ways to do it. But this is my preferred way because it, it, you can get it right away. Okay. When you do that, uh, these are the shape functions you come up with. You come up with uh, basis functions. Okay. Basis functions, but we call them shape functions. These n1, n2, n3, and n4. I can put them in a nice vector format. So I have n1, n2, n3, n4, and then this is my vector of unknown quantities. You agree that this times that is basically what I have at the bottom here? Yeah? OK. Um, so let's, let's, see if this, let's see if this actually makes sense. Let's see if this makes any sense whatsoever. So when I plug in, so this <coughs> n1 and n2, 
belong to V1 and theta1. That's who they belong to. So remember, these shape functions belong to, to an unknown quantity in, in which has physical meaning. Uh, this N1, which belongs to V1, corresponds to node 1. I will have expected that if I substitute x equals 0 here, that I get a quantity of 1. Let's see if that's true. Can I plug this in here? x equals 0, 0, I get 1. Yeah. I have Kronecker delta property there. Okay. Uh, likewise, when I evaluate what is this quantity at x equals L at the other side, at the other node, you will see very quickly that if I put L and L here, I get minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1. So I get 1 minus 1, 0. Okay. So it satisfies the Kronecker delta property. And uh, I can also check what for N2, N3, and N4. Okay, you can check them also. And it's going to work out. It's going to satisfy the Kronecker delta property. Okay. Now, uh, I'll move on here. Now, one thing to point out, you can, for N2, I cannot just substitute 0 here. Because N2 goes with the rotation. And so if I put 0 here, that doesn't make any sense. I'll get 0, actually. What you have to do to verify this one is take the derivative of N2. Let's take the derivative of N2. What do I get? I get 1 minus 4x divided by L plus 3x squared divided by L squared. If I now substitute 0, I get this 0 and I get 1. Okay? It works out. And you can check that at N prime, at the other node location, L, you will get 0. So you can check all these things. And you can plot them. You can plot these things, these shape functions. Uh, this is how the plot looks like for N1, N2, N3, and N4. And here, what I've done is shown you the value of the shape function, of each of the shape functions, um, uh, at x equals 0 and x equals L. Okay? And, and those are the values. These for the first one, second one, third one, and fourth one. There's a question in the back. Yeah, they're complete, they're linearly independent, and uh, they satisfy the Kronecker delta property as shown here. Do um, you have a question? So I'm wondering why would N1 be N1 is what? Why wouldn't N1 not be complete? Wouldn't it be missing in Remember, when, OK, so the question for the video is, uh, why is N1 complete? The, the answer to your question is, in the homework and the exam, maybe, there are problems where you have to satisfy the essential boundary condition. You're forced to do that. And when you do that, some terms will, have, will not have shown up, right? But as long as you satisfy the essential boundary condition, that's what it matters. Uh, it is complete. Um, in, in fact, it is complete. And I know that because we started with a full polynomial. I started with a full um, polynomial here. You see, I started with a full polynomial here. I didn't, I didn't skip any terms. So it's complete. And I tried to enforce that by satisfying all the boundary conditions. And I kept up, came up with my four basis functions. So by doing that, it guarantees me that what I have is robust, complete, uh, satisfy Kronecker delta property, satisfy partition unity. Now, this is a more systematic approach. In weak form Galerkin, it was not very systematic. It was like, you figure it out. You tell me how the polynomial looks like, remember? You have to come up with that first term first, and then figure out what your second term looks like, and your third term. I didn't tell you how to figure that out. You have to figure it out on your own. Here, I'm basically kind of, it's systematic. I can't, I'm kind of stuck. I know what my shape function, basis functions are going to look like. And I know uh, that it's going to meet certain properties, and I can check, them, check it whether it's correct or not. Okay? So it does work very nicely. All right, so um, you can also uh, go home, actually, take W tilde and plug in all these N1, N2, N3, N4, and check that if I set W tilde at, at 0, I get 0, OK? It will satisfy all of them. It's going to give you, sorry, at W tilde at 0, you should get B1, I'm sorry. And you will get that. You will get it. Uh, so, so it's going to satisfy all these boundary conditions for that element. It's going to work out. OK, so what is my next step uh, in developing uh, the solution, the, the element formulation? What is my next step? Now I have my proximate function. I have my proximate function here. 
What do I do now? What is my next step? I plug it into weak form. That's what I do. For W, I select the approximation function. For the weight function, what do I select? Each of the basis function, OK? Each of the basis function. How many equations will I have then if I select each of the basis functions uh, for V? I will have four equations. How many unknowns I have? Four. So I'll have a four by four matrix, hopefully, when we get through this. And uh, in preparation, in preparation to doing that, I, I have to. Re I realize I have a double double prime, right? To prepare for that ahead of time, I calculated double double prime here, which is basically derivatives of the shape functions, double derivatives. And I'll call this b. I'll, I'll store it in my memory. That's b bold. And then uh, this is my deflection vector, d. Okay? And you can calculate b very quickly. So b's, if I know the n's, can I calculate b's? I mean, so these are these guys here. Okay? I really encourage you, uh, when I derive these things at home, which I actually did at home, and I also typed it, I think you also should derive it at home. Because that's the only way you will learn I mean, I'm sorry. Some of you will probably pick it up and remember forever. But for others, I think it's important you actually write it out. For me, I had to write it out when I took the course. You know, I couldn't, the professor or the teacher will say, this is true, and I say, mm-hmm, yeah. I had to go home and check it, OK? I encourage you to do it also. All right, so now I have, I'm prepared. Now I'm prepared. I have dolly dolly prime uh, for that. I have. Uh, a single, I think I have a, just a V there, so nothing more here, really. Uh, so I'll plug it in for each of the equations. I did it here. Uh, for each V, so for V, I put N1, uh, so you can see there the N1s. For the second V, I put N2. For the third equation, I put N3. You can see it here very quickly. Um, and you quickly realize, you quickly realize that. For the first equation, as an example, let's do the first equation. For the first equation, do you realize that uh, it belongs to n1? You realize that this is 1 here? It is 1. And then you'll also notice that this will be zeros. These guys will be zeros. OK, so you have 1 there. And then for the second equation, you'll find that this is 1, but the rest are 0. For the third equation, you'll find that all these other ones are 0 except for that one. That will be 1, and then so forth. Okay, so in reality, you get if I look at the four equations, what I got for the boundary condition is q1, q2, q3, q4. May as well just put in a matrix vector q bold, right? And then also you notice as n1 double prime, double prime, triple, n3 double prime, n4 double prime. This is basically b but transpose, doesn't it? Let's look back here for a second and notice that. So it's basically b but transpose. You agree? Everybody agrees? Yes? OK. So uh, when I do that, I get a B transpose. I'll put it in, on the left. And why do I know that I should put it on the left? At the end, I should have a 4 by 4 matrix. If I had done, by mistake, B times B transpose, it would be wrong because B is 1 by 4, B transpose is 4 by 1. So I'll get a 1 by 1. That's not right. I should get a 4 by 4. So you know that the B transpose should go on the left. You also notice this n1, n2, n3, n4 are in a column. So that's basically n transpose. You agree? I defined that earlier, if you recall. Um, that's basically it. That's my element formulation for b, right there. And the d does not depend on dx, so I'll bring it outside. And this is my stiffness matrix right here. And this is my force vector. This is due to distributed forces. And this is due to concentrated forces, or internal. These are internal loads, by the way, at this point in time. There's a question. Uh, this was several elements, so that vector q would be only on the elements that we have applied load or displacement? So, so the question is, if I have that q for several elements, remember, the q is only specified at the very end of the problem, when you, once you assemble everything together. This, this q here. Remember, these are internal quantities. Okay, we'll give we'll give some examples so you can see how this works. Okay, so now another way to do this, another exciting way maybe for some of you, or boring for others, 
<laughs> if I minimize this total potential energy, if you remember this, we derived this formula before. If I minimize this, I get the weak form. If I start from here, the strong form, and I develop the weak form, I get that. So they're all three, they're all three connected very nicely. So I could pro probably start here too. I can start there and do the same process and see if I get the same thing. And I did that. Um, <clears throat> this is the total potential energy. And I plugged in, I did a trick, and this is a trick I've been doing for a little while now. You, you see me do it. Uh, w double prime, I separate into two of them. And this one I put transpose. Oh, this is a scalar quantity at this point. It's not a matrix. But W double prime transpose times W double prime, really the scalar the transpose of a scalar is a scalar. So this times that is really that squared. Uh, here I didn't do anything. That's fine. And here is really quick what do you have to do. For dolly dolly prime, you put BD, right? Remember dolly dolly prime was BD? Let me remind you. I see some uh, faces of confusion. Look at this. B, D is dolly dolly prime. Just to remind you. That's where we were at. And, and don't feel bad because um, I've been doing this for a long time. And even when I'm doing this at home, deriving it, I have to look back and check. Remember, trust the system. Trust that what you wrote before is right. Okay. Except if you're doing a midterm, you have to check your work 10 times, right? Um, okay. All right. So we plug this in. For dolly dolly prime, we plug in BD. For dolly dolly prime, we plug BD. Okay. And then for W, plug in D transpose N transpose. And for these guys, uh, we plug in D transpose Q. It's basically D transpose Q. Uh, and now I realize here that this uh, order changes. Because when you have a, a, a matrix and a matrix of the transpose, basically the order changes. So I have D transpose first, B transpose next, and I have B, D, D transpose N transpose, just like that. Okay. Now. I take, if you remember from maybe two lectures ago, we already covered this. If you minimize the total potential energy with respect to V1, theta1, V2, theta2, uh, in reality, all you're doing is uh, just remove this D transpose here, this D transpose, this D transpose, and you're left with the, with the equation for the element. This equation here, matches what I got with weak form Galerian. It, it gives me the same thing, exact same thing. Okay? So I'm showing you many, di many different examples I've given now where I use total potential energy and I use a weak form. In both ways, I got a really nice answer. Okay? All right, so any questions on that? Okay. All right, so now that I have this done, why, why, why not just plug in this into Mathematica? I know B already B transpose, I know B, plug it in, just Mathematica do the integrals for you, um, and, and you can basically get the answer to the problem. So the stiffness matrix for a single element, local stiffness matrix, the element stiffness matrix looks like this. Um, it's four by four, and you have V1, theta one, V2, theta two, um, and then this is your distributed force vector, okay? Um, and then you have the lo internal loads, Q1. Remember this, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 internal loads to the element. And so here are your, uh, your vector for that. So now you're ready. Now you're ready to solve any problem that you want to do. Uh, but now you have to, uh, the next step, I have the element formulation for one element. Then I have to, uh, basically, if, if I have a, this, will, this is what you will program into Abacus A. If I was the abacus programmer, the one developing abacus, this will I'll program in. And then, from now on, if I give you a problem, you'll discretize it yourself. You will calculate this for each element, right? And then you'll assemble it. And then you'll solve the system of linear equations. Linear in this case, OK? Any questions? OK. OK. In the, in the, in the, in the, uh, connectiv connectivity, the code number, you're going to start here 1, 2, and then 3, 4. So when you write it here, it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, okay great. Uh, so that for a uniform load, for a distributed uniform load, uh, transverse load, 
for that special case, uh, you get QL over 12, 6 minus L, 6L. Let's see if this is correct, whether this makes sense or not. QL over 12 times 6 is how much? QL over 2. QL over 12 times 6 is QL over 2. That goes with that node. This goes with that node. Uh, that makes sense. That's the transverse load that has to support that load. So what is the distributed load? Uniform load? Q, right? What is the length? L. Q times L is its total force acting downwards. So it has to be supported by QL over 2 here and QL over 2 here. It came automatically, OK? I can also, we can also discuss the moment, although it takes a little more work. So let's skip that here for now. OK, any questions so far? I just did a special case, but uh, this is the most general case for euler bruno beam. OK, so let's do an example. I think an example is a great way to do, illustrate this. I have this uh, beam. Uh, I have a boundary condition here, a boundary condition here. I put a couple here and a, and a force downward, downward force here. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but maybe mechanics and material don't solve like a differential equation for each piece and make it equal to each other and then solve like a bunch of differential equations and all that. Well, this method is, is seamless. It, it just works for indeterminate systems, for determinate systems. I don't know if you remember also uh, in, in mechanics and materials, there was a case where the system was indeterminate. So you will put a fake load or you'll remove the boundary, right? Some, pe some people in the back are saying yes. I assume that you guys all took mechanics and materials, right? Do you guys work with indeterminate systems, right? So if I have a clamp condition and a pin condition here and I put a distributed force, there's a lot of work there to do because you have to figure out how to deal with indeterminate problem. You don't have to worry about this anymore because uh, we can use finite elements. And so here, I'll divide the domain into three logical elements. I could divide into 200 if I want. I just did three. One here that stops there and coincides with that. A second one here that stops there and coincides with that. So then I have three elements, three elements. Um, and then I'll, I'll, this is basically uh, V1, theta 1, V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3, V4, theta 4. Basically, this is what I have for my, for, for my system. Now, if I were to write the code numbers, the connectivity matrix, for element 1, I have V1, theta 1, V2, theta 2. For element three, 2, I have V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3. For element 3, I have V3, theta 3, and V4, theta 4. I can now very quickly apply uh, for element one. I kind of, uh, I'm showing you how to write the code basically. If you were to this, do this in MATLAB or some code, I already expanded it. I already know that I'm going to have how many unknowns? Eight. I have eight basically. Eight. So I just create an eight by eight matrix, big one, okay? And I populated element one. So element one goes here, okay? I populated there. For element two, it's somewhere here. Okay. Okay, and you can check it that I put it in the right location. Um, you know, makes sense uh, because it has the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth position. And if I look here back, one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, element two, so that's three, four, five, six. So it has to encompass that block from three to six. And so if you see here. That's what I did. I'm, I'm, I'm populating the block that, that's 3 to 6. 3, columns 3 to 6, and then row 3 to 6. I'm populating just that. Okay? And then I can now populate element uh, for, uh, for element 3 here at the top. So here, the bottom four uh, blocks basically 4 through 8. Okay? All filled out. Now I can assemble it together. I'm doing it differently than I've done it before. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to maybe teach you how to code this up. So uh, I'm showing you big picture how the code is working. Okay. So now I can add element 1, 2, and 3 together. And then these are the assembly ones. This is how you, you get automatic assembly there. We can do it old school, like I taught you before. We can put uh, numbers for each um, Row and column, right? Remember, one through four, one through four, and then assemble it the old way. That that works too. Uh, so now I have my eight by eight matrix. 
I have my uh, unknown quantities here, and then I have the external loads now. These are the external loads now. Because the internal loads from one element to another add up to form and to basically be equal to the external load. So now I'll impose the boundary condition. That's the next step. So when I impose the boundary condition, I know on the left hand side, remember it was clamped? Yes? Yes. So if it's clamped, then V and theta are zero. Uh, then, I don't know if you recall, but uh, in, that, in that next node, I had a pin condition. Is everybody with me here? Yes. So then that's zero. And if, if you recall, the next node over, also I had it fixed vertically, remember? So I imposed those boundary conditions. And on the left hand side, uh, because these are imposed, this must be reaction forces. They have to be. And if you recall, in node two, did I apply any moment? I didn't apply anything. Let me show you the picture in case you can't remember it. That was a picture. That's node one, node two, node three, node four. There's nothing here. I'm not applying any moment there. But I am applying a moment there. So uh, when I look here, um, uh, V3, node three, I I'm putting a pin condition. So I must have a reaction force. And then I'm applying also a moment in that location of minus C, the opposite sign from what I have developed for uh, general element is in the opposite way. So minus C, uh, and then uh, um, in the end, remember at the end of that, I apply a force downwards, minus F. Did I apply any moment at the end? No, so that's zero. And so now, okay, this may look messy here, but it's not that messy. What I did is I try to cross out anything that has zeros. Uh, and then if you look here, you're left with solving this uh, basically was left, okay? You can just solve that, okay? Uh, here on the left hand side, I reduce the stiffness matrix. Uh, these are the only ones that are non-zero. The only ones that are non-zero. Uh, you can solve here for uh, the deflections, theta two, theta three, V4 and theta four. And once you have this, you can get the reaction forces by plugging in these numbers, okay? All right, how many follow that example? Do you follow that example? Yeah. Excellent, thanks for raising your hand if you did or nodded. That's very helpful, okay? So let's look at another example. Another example here is a distributed force that's um, acting part of the beam, A, eh? and for the rest I apply a downward force, F. Uh, in this example, I will divide into two logical elements, one here and one here, and uh, here you can see how I set it up, okay? So the next step is discretize the domain into elements. Element one, element two, and then I have nodes one, two, and three, okay? For element one, I just use the formula. The element formulation that I have is, I can use for any element. I just have to change the length. The length is A for the first element, the length is B for the second element, okay? Um, so I did it unequally, uh, unequal element size, so you can see that this element can be used for either longer or shorter, it doesn't matter what. Um, and so if I do that, oh, by the way, how many, how many no, uh, degrees of freedom I have here at the bottom? Six, so that's why I have a six by six matrix. So I expanded a six by six. Oh, my force vector, this is my force vector. Uh, I, I used the, remember I had the special case for uniform loading? I just used that formula here. Um, and then these are the internal loads acting on that element one. Then for element two, again, uh, it, this occupies the bottom right block, and uh, basically I'm, I'm ready to assemble. I'm ready to assemble now. Uh, the global assembly uh, is this one here, okay? Uh, the internal loads add up, and they have to be equal to the external load applied. In this example, uh, in this example, remember the left-hand side was clamped? So U1 and U2 is zero, that's it. On the uh, four side, on the four side, oh, if I, these are zero, I must have a reaction force, don't I? So I put Q1 and Q2 there. Um, and also, uh, at U3, I had no force applied. At U4, I had no moment applied. At U5, I had no displacement, up, uh, um, I had no uh, moment applied. I think this is probably a uh, wrong. Okay, I applied a force downwards. That goes with V3. So that's a small error here. 
F should have gone here and zero at the bottom. There's no moment of light. So switch F and then zero here. It was a small mistake. If you can help me record that. Excellent. Now I'm ready to solve the problem. Uh, you can just solve the bottom four equations, basically. Uh, four unknowns, four equations. Solve for these four. Once you have it, plug it back in. Multiply the stiffness matrix by this column, and you will get the reaction forces Q1 and Q2. Any questions on that? Simple? Yes? Probably the simplest class so far, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe you're getting used to the idea of facing these differential equations with uh, weak form glergin, Riley Ritz, and so forth. OK, so how do I do this uh, um, with axial flexibility? What if I have axial flexibility? Not only have transverse loading, but I also have axial loading to that bar. I can do that. I can do that. All I have to do is the principle of superposition. I already divided the equation for a bar. I know the equation for a beam. So now, instead of having just V1, theta1, V2, theta2, I'll just add here U1 and U2. You follow? Yeah? Yeah, because v, v, V1 and theta1 and V2, theta2 are acting vertical. Theta1 and theta2 are the rotations at each end, the slopes. And then U1 and U2 are the axial displacements. Why not just combine two? And then I have a nice element that does axial loading, and it does bending. You see my point? OK. If I do that, then all I have to do, I already know the stiffness matrix. Remember the stiffness matrix for elastic bar? What is it? You should know this by memory now. I've done, done it like five different ways. EA over L, 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. Remember? Yes? OK, so all I did here is our augmented, augmented the matrix. And now I have EA over L, EA over L. And you see zeros everywhere else because I don't want to couple. I don't want to couple this deflection here with a vertical load. This deflection is what causes the beam to stretch. And V is what causes the beam to bend. I don't want those to get coupled. So that's why you see those zeros there. Um, and I should have a minus sign there, symmetric. And then I have that, OK? I'll let you stir for a few minutes here. Yes? Pretty simple, right? All I did was to augment the matrix to include the axial flexibility. OK? In this theory, there's no coupling between beam between vertical displacement and axial displacement. In this theory, I can make it coupled if you want for your file. I can make it the composite material. A composite material, if you have an asymmetric composite material, right, then you can have coupling between stretching and bending. Okay. In this case, it's fully isotropic, so in this case, uh, there is no coupling. But we can make a very couple, very quick. <laughs> okay. All right. Any questions? A simple example: take take a take a, a, a two metals, one very weak, and one very strong. What do you think will happen when I stretch that bimaterial part? It should have some bending, because it's not purely symmetric, right? There's some difference in there, OK? Yeah? In, in modulus, there's a difference, right? And thickness. So maybe I'll get some bending. Okay. But in this case, we're assuming everything is isotropic. OK, I'll let you stir this enough. All I've done here is combine the matrix I developed for beam with the matrix that I divide for elastic bar. That's all I have done. I'll complicate it a little bit more, because I need to. This is too boring otherwise. What if I want to take that beam and rotate it at some angle? Why not do that? What, what use does it do if everything was straight? <laughs> I can't solve a single problem, I don't think. Maybe I can solve the, the few problems, but not, not a lot of problems, right? Like the one I showed you at the beginning of the class, with these bridges and this uh, tower, right? Trust tower, can't solve that. 
I have to be able to rotate it also. So if I rotate it uh, amount P, I won't go over this 100% because I kind of covered how to do this before with the trusses. But it's the same process. Here what I'm doing, you can see here U1 prime, V1 prime, and I have U1 and V1. And then I have U2 and V2, and then U2 prime, V2 prime. So I'll develop the element in the prime system. In the prime system, you agree that in the prime system, the local system, I know what it looks like, the Stiffson's matrix, I know exactly how it looks like. I showed it to you. It was this one here. This is true in a local system. And I can rotate it around, take it with me, as long as that axis along the length stays along the axis for locally, this is true. But I have to relate it to the global system. I have to relate it to the global system. And to do that, uh, you have to transform it. You have to transform it with this transformation matrix. And notice that on the third row, in third column, I have a 1. In the third row, in third column, I have a 1. I have a 1 there because rotations, if I rotate it, the, the slope doesn't matter. The angle is theta. It doesn't matter what coordinate system. So it's not affecting that. The only thing it's affecting is u1 and v1 and then u2 and v2. For that reason, the transformation matrix we use for trusses is basically identical, except for this extra 1 here that's for the rotation. So if I multiply this transformation matrix times D, I get the local system, OK? I, this particular T, if I multiply it by the global, this U2, V2, U1, V1, I'll get the local system D prime, OK? And then this is your D right here. Now I can do the same with the forces. For the forces, the same way, uh, you know, P1 prime, V1 prime, P2 prime, V2 prime. The moment, the same way, the moment doesn't really transform because the moment is a moment. It doesn't care what coordinate system. That's why you see a 1 there for that and then 1 for that one, okay? Uh, similarly, I can take the force in the global system times this transformation matrix gives me F prime. So this is a transfer function. This is a transfer function between the global coordinate system and the local coordinate system. And it's the local coordinate system for which I know the stiffness matrix. That's the one I know the information about, OK? Um, all right. I can also, if I had a distributed load here, I had a distributed load here in the local system, I can also convert that to a global system. You know, so here, for example, F prime could have distributed forces also. You could have that situation, OK? Um, OK, any questions? Any questions? The shape functions. N1, N2, N3, N4 are the shape functions for a beam. I added, remember, this row corresponds to the axial. So that's why there's a 0. And this row here corresponds to axial loading also. So the, the distributed load is acting perpendicular to the bar, the beam, right? Yes? That's why you don't see anything here. OK? You get it? Yes? We're good? OK, so now I'll use these relationships. I know that F prime equals TF. I know D prime equals TD. I also know that F prime equals K prime D prime. And this K prime, I know it. This K prime is the one I gave you earlier, this big one here. OK? So all I have to do is for F prime, I substitute TF. You can see it there. For D prime, I substitute TD. That's there. I want to solve for f. So if I invert t, I get t inverse. Now, t inverse is t tra transpose, remember? Yes, remember from trusses? Yeah. So then you get f equals t transpose times k prime times t transformation, t. So this becomes your new stiffness matrix. And f and d are now in a global system. They're now in a global system. OK? Yes? So. Fairly, fairly straightforward, I think. If you've done trusses now, you should be able to do this one as well. Okay. So uh, here are some examples where you could get beams with axial flexibility. So this is not made up. This, these are situations that could happen. Say I have a frame, and I apply a force here and a force here. I could get some amount of bending. In this case, I have a hinge here and a hinge here. If I apply a load this way, these guys are acting like pins. 
Okay, can you see that? Like if I have a beam on a roller, can you see that? And then can you see that these guys here can act like a spring, preventing the, low, the bending? Okay. So all I'm trying to point out with this picture is that these situations are real. They can happen. You can have beam and axial loading at the same time. Um, let's not spend too much time on this because I want to show you that abacus has its element. In fact, if you did this by hand, you'll get the same answer as abacus. Okay? The, the, what we're trying to do here in this class, we're not trying to, we're trying to give you the fundamentals about what the code is doing, abacus is doing, but we also want to give you some practical experience. And sometimes it's very difficult to know if, if you just use the Feynman code and you don't have any theory knowledge of what Abacus is doing or Nastran or ANSYS, um, it's difficult to know what to look for sometimes. And so now you guys know order Bernoulli beam, right? Can you, can you state that? Can you, can, do you feel good about that? I feel good. I, I think you guys get it. Um, so knowing that information, when you read the theory manual for Abacus, this came from the theory manual of Abacus. You can see here, oh, B is for beam. That's the element type. Okay, three, that's uh, whether I have a beam in a plane or 3D. Well, everything I analyzed today was in a plane, right? You agree? So it's probably two, what I'm going to select for the examples. Um, one, okay, so one, linear, quadratic, or cubic? Huh, that looks familiar. Uh, I guess linear is linear interpolation, maybe? Does that sound familiar? Or quadratic interpolation, or cubic interpolation. Well, I think it's cubic, remember? That's what we use, cubic. So that most likely the example we'll do is two or three. Okay? And I won't discuss this other one. These are other options you have. Okay, so B23 is the element we actually derived in class today. This is the one we did today. I won't do B33 because that's 3D and it's more work, right? But you guys, as long as you get the idea of what we're trying to accomplish, I think. You know, you, if you read the theory manual on how to derive this element, you will follow it at this point in time. They have a theory manual that's very strong. So now, let, let's read. read this comes from the theory manual. Let's read to see if you guys understand what this is. Order beam, slender beams. Is that what we talked about? The order Bernoulli beam is good for slender beams. I continue reading here. Order Bernoulli beam is available in Abacus standard. Fine. These elements do not allow for transverse shear deformation. Isn't that what we said? that the cross-section remains normal after deformation, so the transfer shear is zero. Yeah? So you understand what we're doing here then in this class? We're giving you a theory, and so now when go to the I go to the manual, I know what they're saying. I know exactly what they're saying. Um, plane sections initially normal to the beam's axis remain plane. I just said that, didn't I? And normal to the beam axis. They should be only used to model slender beams. We talked about that. The beam's cross-section dimension should be small compared to the typical distances along its axis. The only difference between what they wrote and what I say is they probably said it better than I did. OK. But I think I said the same thing. Um, for beams made of uniform material, typical dimensions in cross-section should be less than about 1 15th of typical axial distance. For uh, for, I don't know, it got cut off, okay? Let's read the bottom here, interpolation. This is continuous, so I did a print screen in interpolation. The order Bernoulli beam element uses cubic interpolation. We, didn't we just derive it? Okay? Which makes them reasonably accurate for cases involving distributed loading along the beam. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? The other parts you may not understand because we haven't gotten into that for dynamics. But if we get to that, you will see that as well. Okay. Are you seeing now that what we're discussing is not out of the blue? Okay. It's connected. Okay. It's connected. Uh, and the trusses. We did the same with trusses. I didn't do a print screen of the abacus manual for trusses, but it's the same way. Okay. Now when I go here and I do an example, so I have, uh, I selected, uh, basically this is the original, uh, I basically took a beam here. There's another beam here. Okay, so two beams. Uh, I apply an, a load in this direction, okay? Uh, and it deforms to this point. So it deforms to this point, and it looks like that, okay? So that's an example of this. This is a deformed case. That's the undeformed. Sorry, this is in 
Correct. This is incorrect. This is undeformed. That's a deformed. So I made an error here. Okay. I labeled it incorrectly. In this example, bin squared cross section is one inch squared, elastic modulus is 10 MSI, applied load of 9,000 pounds. So how do I do that? So I, I have only three nodes to worry about in this example. Uh, one, two, and three, okay? Uh, I put some nodal coordinates. Uh, element type equals B23. Two, three. two is planar, three is ordered Bernoulli cubic interpolation. Uh, so then I have two elements only for this example, one and two, okay? Beam section, so I have to define the section of that beam. I have to tell it, you know, what kind of beam section do I have? Do I have a circle, a square, what do I have? Uh, so it's a beam section, I said section equals rectangular. Now, how do I know what options do I have? So Abacus has something called the keyword manual, okay? And the keyword manual will tell you what options you, you can select. You can se select a, a square with a, a thin wall or a circle, a hollow cylinder, a pipe, you know, for example, you can select many different cases. Uh, you can select different inertias. You can, if you know the, the cross section of the beam and you don't know the geometry, but you know the inertias, IXX, IYY, IZZ, all this, you can define that directly also. Uh, the element set is LM, material is aluminum, so then I say, okay, material name equals aluminum, elastic, modulus 10 MSI, plus generation 0.33. Uh, I'm going to fix, it's clamped here at these nodes, two and three. I made them into an uh, element set fixed. I put the two nodes there, two and three, right there. I put them in a set. Uh, on the side I'm applying the load, I put a set name just to keep track of the name, load application, I called it. That's for this node here. Um, and then that's it, step, static, boundary, fix, one through six, um, C load, concentrated load basically, and then load application in the one direction, 9,000 pounds, end step, run, bam, done, given here, okay? And then if I want to check the reaction force, just for the kicks I was checking to see if I did it correctly, um, which I'm kind of teaching you how I check my models. So I know I applied 9,000 pounds, well, this should be reacting 4,500 pounds. And that's what I got, 4,500 pounds of these nodes. I checked other things like displacements and, you know, you can check many things. Okay, <clears throat> you guys follow this example? I also did a, a check also, just for fun. Uh, just one element, but put a plane of symmetry. Can you see that there's symmetric about here? So I made it symmetric, and I allowed this to uh, move in this direction you know, with a roller. Um, and uh, I fixed the rotation so it didn't rotate, okay? So doing that, um, I got the same answer. It, this one moved 0.183, this one moved 0.183, just with a single element. Um, you can see here, just with one element, I did it. Uh, and then the boundary conditions look different now. Because for the load application now, I'm preventing it from moving down at that location where I'm applying load because it's symmetric. I'm not letting it go down. Uh, and also, I'm not letting it rotate at that plane, because you can't rotate about that plane. And with that information, oh, I also put half the load, so 4,500 pounds, because I'm only simulating half of it, okay? Got the same answer, okay? Okay. All right, so uh, I was thinking um, that it would be a good idea now to uh, have um, uh, try our experiment again, where we're going to try to teach advocates using um, uh, interactive, you know, in this course. Uh, so with that, well, let's take a couple minutes break. Next Tuesday, I'll uncover Timoshenko beam theory, which is also used in advocates. So Timoshenko is in advocates. That'll be the next lecture on Tuesday, okay? For now, let's try this experiment again and see how we can do this. Okay, so uh, to use the application Navacus, we're going to solve um, this problem. It's a play with a hole in the middle uh, under uniaxial stress. All right, uh, we're going to take advantage of the two planes of symmetry that we have in this problem. So it means that we're going to just model a quarter of the of the plate. Okay, uh, if you remember the stress applied, the remote stress. 
is 100 megapascals. We're going to distribute this stress across the thickness by multiplying to the thickness. So it means that the, the, the load applied through the model in Abacus is going to be the 1,000 kiloneurons per meter. So let's switch to Abacus. And let's start with the first part, the fir first section, which is basically the cat of the, um, of the problem. In order to do that, you, we need to go through the um, toolbox area. We need to click and create, create a part. Once we create a part, we can name this part by plate, for example. This is a modeling in the 3D space. We're gonna, the type is gonna be deformable. And for the shape, we're gonna use shell. Uh, it could be also possible to solve this problem by solid, by the shape solid, but we, we, we can simplify it by using a shell um, shape. The type is gonna be planar. So this is basically the characteristics we need to set up. The approximate size for this grid due to the geometry of the problem is gonna be two at this, for, um, at this moment. And you just continue. So we can use um, all the, the icons we have in the cat. So let's draw a rectangle defined by two vertices. So let's pick the first vertice and then select the next vertice. Our dimensions for this um, rectangle, which is, I re remember, is a quarter of the plate. It's gonna be um, one inch by point five, uh, one meter, sorry, by one point, by a half a meter. So if we go to this icon, we can um, define the dimensions for them, for the plate. So just click in the side of our interest, remove, click again. We can go to the prompt area, which is right here, and we can type one, enter, and you can see that the dimension is modified. You will repeat the same procedure for the other side. Mm, we can obtain the, the, the desired um, rectangle. All right, what, what's the next step? The next step is to um, model the quarter of a circle that belongs to the quarter of the hole in the plate. So let's go to this icon, create an arc based on the center and two points. Click on that, select the, the, the center, which is this. Click in the first point for the arc, which is the intersection. Um, with the plate, with the rectangle. Just click there and then drag to the next point, which is the next intersection. When it is done, just click escape and l let's define the radius for the, for the arc. So let's again to this icon at dimension, click in the arc, drag to the center of the arc, Right and define the dimension. In this case, it's 0 0.02 um, two meters, the radius for the hole. Just enter. This is the new hole. If you want to fit, uh, out of fit all the um, the cat in the in the grid, you just need to click this button out of fit on top, and you will be able to see it. So once the cat is done, we we need to finish um, this section just by click done in the prompt area and the part would be done, will be created. Uh, let me see. Give me one moment. Oh, I missed one part, sorry. Uh, you can see that we have these small segments that we need to trim. I forgot to do that. So let's go to trim, which is this icon, out of trim, and pick the segments we need to remove from the, from the cat. Now it's done. 
should be should be uh, should work. So now push down again, and here is the part. All right. So let's move to the next uh, module module in the in the yes. No, once I, I push down, it becomes a, part, a solid part of automatically. It knows that it's now a, a solid part. Yes, it's assigned as a solid part. Yes? We're going to do it later. OK, so for now, we have the, the cat, which is basically a rectangle. It's a plane. OK, now let's move on. And we're going to define in the, in the in the um, toolbox area, we're going to define the material first. The material is going to be steel for this case. Since this is an elastic problem we are solving, so let's hit, uh, let's, push, uh, um, let's push mechanical, elasticity, this is the problem, and elastic. All right, so the new window, we need to specify the type of material we are modeling. So this is an isotropic. So by default, it's isotropic. We should change this condition. But we need to define the junction modulus and the Poisson ratio. OK? Remember, even though we um, draw a plane, this is a solid model. So it would deform in all directions. So we need to define the Poisson ratio in order to take in account this effect. So for the steel, we have 200 gigapascals. And the Poisson ratio we're going to set as a 0.3. Let's push OK again. And the material is created. You can verify it by clicking the icon to the, to the right, which is the material manager. We, you can check that the steel material has been created. Now, probably this step is going to answer your question about when we need to set up the thickness for this model. So, we're going to create a section. That section, let's call shell. That's going to be the category is shell, right? And it's homogeneous. So this is uh, the previous step. The step was a cat. Now we are getting to the 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 final element model by itself. So if we continue this window that pop up. Um, allow us to define the thickness for the, for the shell. So in this case, the thickness um, is 0 0.01 meters. OK? We check that the material is the one we, we, we desire. That's the steel. And we can use uh, any uh, of these two numerical methods of integration to go to carry out the integrations, as we did. So let's check Gauss, just to match what we already done during the class. And if you remember, for the Gauss quadrature, we need to define the number of points uh, of the integration, right? Um, we learned that two is most of the time, the, the number for, of points of integration that we use. OK, let's do two. However, later on, I'm going to use another feature when I will require a reduced integration. So I would prefer to stick with three as, a, as is a state in, the, in, the, in, the, in this window as a default, because I run it um, with two points of integration, and the results um, were more accurate with this, um, with this number of points of integration. So I'm going to stick with three for now. So let's push OK again. And then, and now, what we need to, what is left is just to assign that section, that shell section we created, assign to the cat. So both with match, right? So let's go to the assign section. Uh, we can create a set or not create. It's, uh, it's not relevant at this moment, just uncheck. Um, let's minimize the model. Mm. Okay, it's, it's selected. 
let me check that um, it's correct. I don't know, it's not working my track today. Okay, let's select. So um, just push done. That window is just to verify what section we are um, assigning to this cat model. So it's the shell section. We don't have another option. And here you can see much better in this area what is the shell what does the shell mean? Even though this um, you can think it's a membrane, but it's not a membrane because we have it's a solid, so we can define this more act like a plate. Okay? So if you click in definition, we we have a top surface, we have a bottom surface, right? So it's still a solid. So we are gonna base all our calculations in the middle surface, like we used to do for the plate theory. So this is like a plate in this case. So it's done. What is the next step? The next step is create um, an instance. When we are creating an instance, it's basically uh, getting, right now we are getting to the FE, uh, final element model. So we need to create an instance for that purpose. It's like bringing from the, from the CAD something to the final element model so we can apply all the conditions. So we're, um, by default, is they create an instance from a part. We're going to stick with that. We're going to say that it's dependent because it's my interest to mesh on the part instead of the instance. So let's keep it as, in, as dependent and push OK. The instance is created. What is next? Let's apply this and create that step to later on apply the load. So let's name, uh, if we go, let me get back. If we go to this icon in the toolbox area, create a step, you click on that, you can name the step, let's say load. This step is gonna be created after the first step that is initial, so just for information. And the type of step, the, the, the procedure for the type is a static general. This is what we know, because this is the kind of problem we are solving. Continue. Since this is a static, we are not defining, for, for example, for the nonlinear cases, we, can, we need a, a city, uh, a several steps to apply the load. This is just one step, one load, right? So we don't need to, to modify any condition, any setup here, because it's only one step. So just push con uh, OK, and the step is created. You can check in the step manager that we have two steps, the initial step and the one we created to apply the load. So let's move on and apply the boundary conditions to this problem. So let's start, let's start with the um, essential boundary conditions. So, um, okay, let me get back. Click, by clicking in this icon, we can create the essential boundary conditions. So the essential boundary condition for this problem, let's say this is um, the left side for the plane number one. We need to set up the step as initial. We need to select in category mechanical. And in the type of selected step, we're gonna state displacement, all right? Could be symmetry, but it's much better displacement in this case. Continue. We need to select the left, the left side edge. Done in the pro, click done in the in the prompt area. And apply the constraint in this area. So this side is not allowed to display. Better, it's only allowed to display in the U2 direction, in the two direction. So let's click the other uh, options. Okay. Let's do the same procedure for the bottom side, which is the one that is lighting up in orange. Let's repeat the same procedure. Bottom side one, initial, mechanical, displacements, continue. Same, exactly the same step. This time we pick this edge at the bottom of the plate, click done, and 
the only possible, the, 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 and the no constrained displacement is going to be in the one direction. By, do, by doing this, we are, we, we are replicating the, or applying the symmetry of the problem, okay? Basically, just as an example, um, this line cannot penetrate the, order, the, the quarter of the plate that is below the, right? This is basically what we're doing. It's making a, a physical sense of this. So what is left is just to apply the load. So let's click in this, in this icon, create load. Let's name as a load. Now, for the load, we need to apply, um, up, uh, select the step we, we previously created, which is we previously created, that's load. The category is mechanical, and we are gonna use a type for the selected step, the shell edge load. So basically, it's, it's a distributed load over the surface. It's not over the line, it's over the surface. So this is what we, we want to do. So shell edge load, continue. We pick, we select the site, of our interest, which is this uh, right hand side, A, H. Click down in the prompt area, and we just need to define is the magnitude for the load. Remember that the, we, di we need to distribute the load across the thickness. So in this case, is that load is uh, 1,000 kilonewtons, which is basically uh, 1 e to the 6 um, newtons per meter, okay? We don't need to modify anything else in this, in, the, in this window. Just push OK and, oh, I did something wrong. You can see the load is going in the opposite direction. Okay, so let me get back and re-edit this load. So that makes sense. Let's go to the load manager, which is the icon to the right. Click on that, edit, and just change the sign to match our problem. Uh, push OK, you, we can close this window, and now you can see that our load make totally sense. All right, so what is next? Let me do something. The next step is mesh this part. So I want to compare. I'm gonna just, to, just repli duplicate this plate. I'm, I'm gonna do that and in order to compare the mesh between one to the other. So the steps are gonna be basically the same, except for, this, for, for the next step, which is the replication, the duplication of the plate. In order to do that, let's go to the module tree. In the module tree, locate where the parts icon is. Expand the parts icon. Right click in the, play, in the, in the, in the part that we created under plate. Just right click. Okay. Mm. I have some problem. Okay, let me try to do it here. Let's go to the top part, copy, plate. Okay, we create, we rename uh, name the, the, the copy. Let's put it plate uh, two. Okay, and just okay. Now we have two parts. How can you verify that? If you go to this section, you can check that you have plate and plate two. We have two parts. They share some similar characteristics, like the features. It's a shell planner, and the section is a shell homogeneous. How did you do that? Just by, by, by expanding um, next to the, to the, number, to the name, name for the plate. So the plate is fine. But we also need to create an instance for this plate. So in order to do that, we can do it here in the, in the, in the, mo in the module tree. Look for assembly at the bottom. Okay. Mm. It's not working my uh, right click in the, my mouse. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to the top. 
Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, just give me one second. All right. Okay, so let's get back. Right click. Thank you. And uh, all right. So this is what we want to do. We want to create over this part a new a new a new instance. So let's go to assembly here. Okay, let me see if I can figure out what I'm doing. In the assembly, we need to create an instance. Okay, I did it. So we need to get back to the assembly, click on the instance again, and select the part of our interest, okay? So this time it's the play number two. It's dependent as well, and we're gonna click this uh, auto offset to be able to see both instances. So if we click this, we can see both in instances, all right? Just okay, and now we have two plays with two instances. Now the next step is to display apply all the, band all the loads and boundary conditions, yes? What instance? It put the uh, next plate yes. next to the one you have. Yes. How does it know what, it's, what, what distance to put it from the other plate? No, it's, you, 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 don't, you don't define the distance between, oh, between that. It's just it's set up uh, automatically. You don't define that. So this, the left-hand side plate, it's the first one we created. The copy is the one to the right. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. Apply the same com uh, boundary conditions to this plate as we did previously. So um, go to load. In load, we're going to repeat exactly the same steps we did. So boundary condition that's going to be um, um, right. No, left. Left side for the play number two, uh, step initial, mechanical, displacement, continue. Um, what we need to do now is to select, oh, let me do something here again. Uh, left side two, initial, mechanical, displacement, continue. Now we can select this line, done. We click all the constraints, OK. Repeat the same for the bottom. Initial mechanical displacements continue. Select this, done. Let's constrain the plate. I don't want this. OK, so it looks good to me. Let's apply the load. We need to create a new load. Let's get set load two, a step, load, mechanical, shell, edge, load. Exactly the same what we did earlier. Continue, select the edge we need to apply the load, <coughs> click done, and then specify the, the, the magnitude for the load, which is one mega newtons per meter. All right. Now you can see both element, both parts. What is next? Mesh. That's the interesting part. So we're going to mesh first the plate to the, to the left. So we're going to see the part instance, which is basically 
set up set how many elements it's going to have. So this no, you, you you need to be careful because we are using a dependent part to mesh the 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 part, right? So we need to we 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 need to switch to part in this area in order to do that, okay? In this moment, the part number two, the, the second plate we created is the one that show up. We want to select the first one. So just click, scroll down, plate, and now we are in business. Let's, let's see the part. We're gonna plus a, apply a global size of 0 0.02. That's basically the distance, uh, the length of the element, or distance between nodes. If we apply, you can see those um, white dots around the plate. This is what we want. But we also want to specify, or specify no, we need to, we want to make, uh, to, to make uh, to de more uh, denser the nodes where the, of the concentration of the stresses happens, okay? So, in order to do that, we need to click in seat edges. Let's magnify this. Click in the arc. Click done. And now we can specify the number of elements by size or by number of elements we, we want. Let's say in this, for this plate, by size. And the size for the element is going to be 0 0.01, even smaller than the global size we assign, we assign for, for all the edges. Okay? We don't need to specify anything else, just the size for the element. Click OK. And now you can see the new seat in this area. All right? What is the next step? The next step is go to the mesh controls and set what is the element shape? In the element shape, we're gonna force, we're gonna work with a quadrilateral. So this is gonna be quad. And we're gonna um, push a structure for our mesh. Pay attention to this scale of colors. When the part turns to pink, it means that the geometry of the part could allow us to conduct a free mesh. It's basically the program is going to do whatever they want. The geometry is completely arbitrary. You don't have any control about that. All right? However, if you want, if you are, um, if you want to pre-establish some specific topologies in the, in, in the plate for your convenience, you can switch to a structure. And this is what we want. All right? We want quad a structure for this case. So let's push OK. It turns to green, which matches with the, the scale, with the color scale. And then what we need to select is the assigned ta element type. The assigned element type is just by clicking this icon. In this window, we're going to select a standard, because it's the correct. Um, we have a standard and explicity. I will take some more time to, to explain what is a standard. So just leave it like that for now, and focus our attention in the geometric order, which basically is the order of our shape functions. In this case, it's linear. This is what we want for this model. So it's going to be a shape function, a linear shape function. Make sure that we pick shell here in the family of the element type, because this is the kind of element type we want. So we 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 click on shell, we stick with the quadrilateral um, element, and we are going to apply a reduced integration. That's the, the Gauss quadrature um, numerical method that we use to integrate, right? So this is, you already know what is the reduced integration. We are lower one, grade, one degree uh, the, the, the integration. So let's keep with reduced integration. This is the element type we're going to use for this plate. S from, from shell, it was a surface, would be SF. Okay, let's, let's click surface for, just for make the difference. You can see how it changed, right? So for shell, it's just S. 
four because this is a four is an element defined by four nodes, and R because it relates it, it mentioned reduce integration. So this is what we have. This is the element. Click OK, and what is left is just to mesh. So if we click in in this icon mesh part, we just need to click to push uh, yes, and the part with mesh. It looks like this. All right. Let's check how it is the mesh at the hole. All right. Okay. Let's move on to the next uh, for the next part. So now we switch the, to the plate number two. In the plate number two, we are basically repeating the same procedure, but assigning a global size of 0.02. Okay. Uh, we're going to um, uh, make uh, denser the, the mesh in this at the hole. So let's do it um, again. Select the arc, click down, stick with uh, by size with 0 0.001 as we did in the previous one, and click down. Uh, OK. So you can see there is no difference so far. Now, it makes sense that if we are making it denser the mesh around the hole, we should make denser the, the mesh in the sides next to the hole. So let's do it. So this is what we need to do. We're going to click to use a single bias. And when we click on, OK, let me see. Let's do it again. I forgot to click to, to click where we want to mesh. So we need to click, let's say, this side, right? And then get back and then click down. And this window would allow us to set up by the number and the, the bias uh, ratio how dense we want the mesh. So we, let's say we want 40 elements but not uniformly distributed along the edge. We want that more elements are assigned next to the hole. So let's increase the ratio, the bias ratio to 10. And let me do something before continue. You can see how the, 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 dense, the, the mesh is going to be denser by following this arrow, this red arrow. Okay. If we want it in the opposite direction, we just need to click flip, and it would be in the opposite direction, OK? So let's get back to the original one, and then click OK. Now you can, you can see all those uh, purple nodes, how dense is the mesh around the hole. Let's repeat exactly the same procedure for the bottom side. So um, select the side, done. 40 elements, keep the same bias ratio, and OK. So it's done. Let's go to the mesh controls, which, was by, uh, which is clicking this assign mesh control icon. The element shape is going to be quad as well. All right? We're going to click a structure, and then OK. Let's assign a type of element. Yeah, part of question, why do you have to click structure? Because you want a specific, uh, you don't want that the program um, define arbitrary geometry for your elements. You want a well-defined mesh with some topologies like uh, triangles, for example, or uh, squares. Okay? okay? All right. So. Um, in this case, we're going to change respect to the to the to the earlier example uh, plate to quadratic order. So our shape functions now are not linear anymore; are quadratic, and we're going to repeat. We're, we're not going to change um, the the family for the element type. It's shell. It's a still quad, and this time, the element type changed to S8R because we have eight nodes to define the element. Click OK and mesh. 
the mesh looks different. Okay? If we go to, to the neighbor to the neighbor to the hole, you can appreciate that it's different from the previous example. Alright? Let's compare. Both. Yes. Excuse me? No, 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 no. The structure decides from from a from a range of um, well-defined geometrics. He defined what is the best for your geometry. Okay, it's defined by itself. Depend on what in the number of nodes and how dense you you make the the the, the mesh at the edges around the hole. Okay. Yes. Excuse me, can you say again? So, uh, can you speak up? So two parallel sides don't have the same number of nodes. Isn't that the reason like the bottom is a little skewed? In the bottom, le in the, for the left or for the right? For the, for the right one and the bottom right. Bottom right. Okay. We have six minutes, so oh, okay. can we take that question and then? Okay. Maybe six minutes. Yes. All right, so this is the mesh. Let's, let's continue and create a job. To create a job, we need to go to the um, toolbox um, area. Um, we need to click here in this icon. Let's name this job um, just plate um, three, just for the name. Uh, continue, click OK, let's submit the job, so go to the job manager, uh, submit the job. If you want to follow the analysis, you can click on monitor and you will be able to follow here. In this case, it's running the analysis, hopefully it's going to complete successfully. It's good. <laughs> All right. So let's see the results. What is our interest? So click on results in the job manager. Um, let me rotate this. OK. This is the results. More interesting that the picture, let's see, okay, let, let's see the deformed shape. It looks like that. If we want the, one of the stresses, we can just select one of the stresses here, and you, you will see some uh, colors around. But I want to show you uh, something more interesting. Let's create, let's see the numbers, okay, about this. So let's get back to the undeformed shape, all right? Let's go to Tools, look for Path, create a path. Let's say that is path number one. Note, continue, click Add Before, and we're going to select the notes of our interest. So let's start with this plate here. This is the first note we want, this one. It's the first note we want. This is the second note we want information for. Let's check how a note, what is the information for a note in the remote uh, side. Now let's repeat the same for this um, plate. This note, just for comparison. Click done. You can identify which notes the, uh, relates with each plate. Just OK. Go again to Tools. Go to XY Data. We are creating a kind of report. 
create, click on path, continue. Here, we made our path based on the undeformed state, so go to undeformed. We are going to follow for the x values the sequence of the ID, uh, ID nodes. Click on fill output. Select the variable of our interest, which is S11 in this case. OK. Save this as S11. Repeat the same procedure for S22. Save as S22. And I think we'll be done. Basically, what we're doing is this. If you click plot, you can see the, the stress versus the, the at each node that we previously picked or selected. OK? So just click this, generate the report, go to report, XY, click on XY, uh, go to setup here, name your report, plate three. Go back to XY uh, to the top XY data. Click on S1, apply because we are selecting that variable for the that result for the final report. Select S22, apply again, and a report is created in the temp file, in temp folder. Sorry. So let's go and look very quickly for the report. This is what is displayed. Okay. So. I already arranged this data in a, in a slide, so let me get back to the slide so we can compare. So this is the last slide we, uh, I have. Um, chum, chum, okay. So this is the last slide. So you can see that for the plate number one, the first two nodes are the one on the top in the A location. The second node was the one in this location with this B. And you can see that for the first um, plate, we should expect that the stress S11 um, one, one at the A location, what it means here, would be three times the remote stress. This is based on the elasticity theory, right? But it doesn't happen for the first plate. But it happens for the second plate. Look at this. Um, Node number four for the, for the second plate. I mean, it's not 300, but it's the best we can get. It's a, an approximation method, right? So 294, which is basically three times the remote stress we apply. You see? Something else. How is the stress at the point B for both plates? It should be S22 should be minus the, minus the, the remote stress, OK? For the, plate, for the first plate, we have minus 26, which is totally off, right? But for the second plate, we have that the node 5, which is at this location, we have minus 82. It's quite close. It's not exactly 100, but it's close, all right? So you can see that by improving the meshing, by shen, by, uh, improving the meshing in the, for the second plate, make it denser around the hole and changing the geometry for the shape functions, it, it, it helps us to get more accurate results. So yeah, I think with this, we end the, the presentation. OK, thank you.